Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, part of the Weirding Way Media Network. Hello, friends. Welcome to 80s TV Ladies, where we explore female-driven television shows from the 1980s and celebrate the people who made them. Here are your hosts, Sharon Johnson and Susan Lambert Haddam. Hello, I'm Sharon. And I'm Susan. Many blessings to Mr. Barney Rosenzweig, producer of Cagney and Lacey, and our own wonderful producer, Melissa Roth, for helping us procure our incredible guest today. This is a dream come true. We shouted it out, I believe, in episode one of season two, when we knew we wanted to cover one of the most quintessential and consequential 80s television shows, Designing Women. Today's guest is none other than the creator of Designing Women herself. Ms. Linda Bloodworth Thomason is a creator, writer, executive producer of so many popular television shows from the 80s and 90s. She's originally from Missouri and some of her early writing credits were on Rhoda and the groundbreaking television series MASH. Her first episode of MASH, Hot Lips and Cold Arms, was co-written with writer-actress Mary Kay Place and creator Larry Gelbart and was nominated for an Emmy. In 1983, she and her husband, Harry Thomason, founded Mozart Productions and created and produced highly lauded and popular television series including Evening Shade, Hearts of Fire, and The Women of the House, and of course, her most beloved work, Designing Women. She has written over 450 scripts for TV. Miss Linda Bloodward Thomason is also a novelist, playwright, and documentary filmmaker, as well as an outstanding philanthropist. We are so thrilled to welcome her to 80s TV Ladies. Hello, Miss Linda Bloodworth Thomason. Well, hello. How are you? We're great. Um, and so delighted to have you join us today for the show. We have long been big fans and you're definitely a hero of ours. And Designing Women is just one of my all-time favorite shows, as well as my mother and my sisters. We still talk about it to this day. So this is such a treat to be able to talk with you. Well, I'd love to hear that. And I think we're like a little secret club all over America, especially in the South. But I, I get it. Everywhere I go, really, if they find out, you know, I'm connected to designing women, um, people always have, women in particular, always have a comment, but especially mothers and daughters and sisters, and it's definitely a generational thing. Uh, unfortunately, now I get the grandma stuff, too. You know, oh, my grandmother, I, I watched that show with her. So, but it's, <laughs> it's very um, uh, rewarding, you know, to hear that it's still appreciated decades later. Well, it's a really particular show that I think resonated with so many people in the 80s, myself included. I'm from Atlanta, Decatur, right outside of Atlanta. Oh, you are? How did you lose that accent? You have no accent. Where did you put your accent? Well, I used to say when I got to to film school out at USC, I sold it to an actress who needed it for a part. (laughs) (laughs) That's it. That's a worthy explanation. Otherwise, I would be upset. (laughs) (laughs) I have a friend who grew up in Atlanta also and has no accent. And and I asked her why one day. And she said, well, I just decided I didn't want one. (laughs) So, And it may have also had to do with the fact that her parents were both um, from England. Oh, I see. You know, so that had something to do with it as well, I'm sure. But yeah, she, same as Susan, grew up there and left without a local accent. I love the Southern accent. My husband is Southern Arkansas, almost Louisiana. And everywhere we go, people comment on his accent because they love it. It's very melodic and soft. And I don't love my own because I'm from Southeast Missouri, which is the boot heel of Missouri. <laughs> and so I've tried to pick his up, you know, but I can't. Um, but anyway, the the Southern accent, I think, was elevated uh, on our show by all of the actors but especially by Dixie Carter, who was from McLemoresville, Tennessee. And she had such an eloquent way uh, of using her accent that 
it actually elevated every speech she made and everything she said in the way that a lot of the very top British actors, you know, when they do Shakespeare, I thought Dixie always reminded me of that, that it wasn't just a Southerner talking, you know, it was, it was um, higher than that. It was memorable. The melody was bigger um, and the elocution was more uh, contagious. You just wanted to hear more of it. So, you know, I'm a fan of anybody who can master that. Absolutely. The the Julia Sugarbaker rant was made all the better by that accent. Yeah, and I think it's something you hadn't really heard before on TV. You've certainly, well, you've always heard the Southern accent of, you know, you need to get out of our town, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that, that stereotype. And then the hyper feminine Scarlett O'Hara thing, you know, I declare and all that. But I don't think anybody ever used it the way Dixie did. And quite frankly, the rest of them, too. You know, um, and Jean was Jean Smart was the only one who was from um, Washington State. But she had a beautiful accent and everyone uh, on the show. She represented Charlene, who was from my actual hometown in Missouri. But she really I, I had so many people say Jean's accent was their favorite. So, you know, you, you can't tell how people are going to respond to it. Did you have a dialect coach for the actors? Not at all, because Delta, you know, just spoke the way she speaks. Um, I mean, she ratcheted up Suzanne a little bit, you know, just in her speech patterns. But And Annie has her own very deliberate way of speaking. It's very Kentucky, um, also melodic, and but in a different way than Dixie's. And um, as I said, Jean was the only person who didn't have one. But hers was beautiful, and she fooled everybody. Um, and Meshach was just Meshach. You know, we never worried about if he sounded Southern. Um, he had some Southern roots, but, you know, he he was just American, uh, and we just didn't worry about it. I mean, mainly, you know, he was a black man, and he sounded like a black man, and we didn't worry about him being from the South. That's so amazing. I love the way that you talk about the regional accents, because so much of the Southern accent is sort of genericized. And that does bug me when, you know, you're watching a theater show or movies or television, when it's just generic Southern accent, and you're like, no, no, there's a difference between yeah. Georgia and Tennessee and Texas. And, you know. Or it's overdone. There was one gentleman who was a dialect coach who my husband believes that he infected at least 30 or 40 old movies because you can tell when actors are overdoing it and it's so pronounced and slow, you know, and he goes, Oh, that guy was, that guy was advising people on this movie. You can tell because it never sounds like anyone we know. Um, But mainly aside from the accent, I also, you know, when I started with designing women and wrote the first, the pilot, you know, and, and when I sold it to CBS, my main goal, you know, I wasn't really thinking of accents. I was really just thinking about the South and how many wonderful, beloved people I knew in the South. And my family is from Arkansas on both sides. And, you know, I didn't see anybody on TV like them. I didn't, you know, and I was so tired again of that Beverly Hillbillies concept. And even in my life, you know, I experienced prejudice out here. Because I would say, oh, you need to come home with me. You know, we have the greatest natural springs in the world and, you know, near my town and this beautiful river and I'll take you canoeing. And, you know, everybody, my agents had seen Deliverance and they were, they were just, (laughs) you know, uh, aghast that I would even think that they would set foot where I'm from. And I just, I didn't even realize the stereotype that I was up against until I came to California because I actually went to school in Missouri to college. So even though it was an international school in the sense that a lot of people from different countries went there, it was still in the heart of Missouri. And I just did not know until I came to LA, you know, how entrenched people were in thinking about the South in that very kind of scary, rural, ominous, ignorant, barefoot, sometimes incestuous way. And that was why I was just determined, you know, to do a show that stood up against that. And fortunately, a lady named Fran Bascom, who I still say is the greatest casting director in the history of television, 
who did all of our shows. Um, you know, she's the one who found those four women. I didn't know them and I would never have come up with them. And, you know, she was just brilliant. And she just always came up with the perfect person. And even more importantly, the most brilliant combination of people that she had already matched in her head. And that's what she did for me on Designing Women. Um, she is no longer with us. Mm. I could not get through her eulogy. It took me forever because I could not stop crying. Just this beautiful red-haired lady, beautiful clothes, beautiful temperament, um, just a joy to be around every day and so supportive of actors and, you know, the ones who hadn't been discovered yet and so confident, never cocky, but so confident that they could do it. And I never saw her fail on that front. I mean, you know, whether it was Billy Bob Thornton or Hillary Swank, who got the Oscar, you know, who nobody knew, uh, whether this was not on Designing Women, but on Evening Shade, Hearts of Fire, this was all Fran Bascom, you know, the brilliant cast on Evening Shade, which actually that cast, that one could have been predicted somewhat, but no one had ever put them all together. I mean, that cast had more Oscar, Emmy, and Tony nominations than any cast ever in television history. I mean, it was Charles Durning, Ozzie Davis, Hal Holbrook, Burt Reynolds, Ann Wedgworth, Elizabeth Ashley. It just went on and on. <laughs> A talent that I haven't seen before or since. And she didn't self-promote it all, so I don't think she's even known to the public. And not even that well known to a lot of people out here, but but she was our secret weapon. That is amazing. Fran Bascom, I'm going to go look her up because, you know, we love hearing about sort of the women behind the scenes mm -hmm. that really did did a lot of the heavy lifting yeah. for this kind of stuff and don't get uh, their, their flowers. Don't get the credit. But, you know, besides that, if you're just talking about someone on a scale of humanity, when my mother had AIDS, and I would leave the hospital late at night. It still makes me cry. She was out in the waiting room. So that's just who she was. That's amazing. And I, I watched a little Evening Shade, rewatched some of it, and noticed yeah. that Billy Bob Thornton is in the pilot. So I did have a question about how that came about. <laughs> but now you just told me. I was like, well, he's from Arkansas, right? So maybe that was a family thing. He is, but we did not know him. We ended up falling in love with him. Actually, he named his son after Harry. And then we went on to do Hearts of Fire with Marky Post, who's one of my dearest friends was, and John Ritter and Billy Bob. And uh, again, Fran did that cast with those three brilliant people. And Billy Bob turned out to be just a wicked comedian, which he hadn't really done. And he and John bonded so much. And I know we're not here to talk about Hearts of Fire, but that cast too, with Leslie Jordan thrown in and the brilliant George Gaines. Um, and Ed Asner, I mean, she put that whole cast together. Billy Bob had one line on um, Evening Shade, but Fran came to me and said, well, listen, I've got somebody from Arkansas, so you and Harry are going to love him. And I had one line where he delivered, he's a flower delivery guy, and he gives the flowers to Burt Reynolds. And it just the way he said it, he came in and said it, you know, like, Wood, these flowers are for you. Burt's name was Wood. Um, and just the way he said it, it was kind of memorable. And Hal Holbrook went up to him afterward and said, I don't know what you've got, but you've got something. So keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> and then, of course, wasn't long before, you know, Billy Bob had an Oscar. So that just kind of shows how prescient and brilliant Fran was. And also how kind of Hal to go up to him and say that to him, yeah. to Billy Bob. You know, he only had one or two lines and... That's not necessarily something that oh, no. often happens. So, yeah. how awesome. That was Hal. Yeah. Hal was like that with everybody. He, he, I always say he was our North Star. You know, he was, and he so adored Dixie. You know, I always say that there's something about Southern men and women when I don't want to make other people mad because I know that people from other parts of the country have just as, you know, uh, wonderful a romance as Southerners, but there's something about Southern men and women and Hal and Dixie personified that. 
you know, that they just had the spark and it was just uh, unquenchable and everybody saw it and it wasn't different on screen. It was the same, you know, all week on the show behind the scenes. I would say we had to like on show night, we had to keep him away from the microphones because everything Dixie did, he just laughed so hard that it kind of ruined the soundtrack. <laughs> and he just watched her, you know, like a, a decided kid who can't believe that this girl accepted his invitation to the prom. Um, and and that was true until the end. I, I wrote a eulogy about them for uh, the Hollywood reporter. And we had so many dinners at their house, you know, that were, so adventurous and it was like a, a dinner at eight movie. I mean, Dixie always had the worst help and, you know, we wouldn't even eat till like midnight and there'd always be a lot of clanging in the kitchen <laughs> <laughs> and Dixie would walk, would sweep back out and say, you know, it's almost ready, it's almost ready. <laughs> and then Hal would just look at her, you know, with a big grin, like he just thought it was all delightful. She used to come to the top of the stairs after everybody was there, and she'd come out in her dressing gown and go, oh, my goodness, is there a party? <laughs> you know, like she'd forgotten. And it sounds so pretentious that I, because it's something most people could not pull off, but they did. And you got the feeling they did that even when we weren't there. You know, then she, honest to God, lie around on the piano and sing and carry on. And it was just the most fun. And But they were both so Southern and her father, Mr. Halbert Carter, you know, was such a close friend of ours and he was such a character, but uh, they kind of represented all the, I, I always wanted to have uh, romance between the men and women on my comedies because I didn't think there was enough of that in the comedies I'd grown up with, you know, I mean, Lucy and Ricky had to keep one foot on the floor and, I just really wanted to show people in love because that's how my parents were. So Dixie and, and how carried that on in spades and then Delta and Joe McRaney, the very same thing. I think like with Gerald, especially, you know, there's like in, in the South, maybe a lot of Southern men who have big, happy marriages, I think have a high density of masculinity, but it's benevolent masculinity. And the women are always, you know, high-spirited feminine. Um, and, I mean, even my husband, I hate to brag, but I've had so many women, you know, where how do I find somebody like Carrie? And I would say, well, you have to go to Arkansas first or the South, and you should find yourself a jock who reads a lot of poetry and loves his mother and cries over the evening news. That's, that's Harry. And they always laugh and they go, oh, that, that's such a weird combination. I go, I know, it's a Southern thing. Um, so I've always tried to get that into my shows. We did it on Evening Shade again, hopefully, between uh, Bert and Mary Lou Henner. Yeah. And with Hal and uh, the wonderful Linda Geringer, who was Fontana Beausoleil on the show. But there's just, you know, and if you look at Southern couples that you probably really admire their marriage, like... Dave Pill and Tim McGraw, or Garth Brooks and Tricia Yearwood, you know, Amy Grant, Vince Gill. There's a romantic spark that stays with these couples that I think is, you know, you want it to be contagious. I mean, I think they make people want to search for that and to find it because it's so appealing. So anyway, that's something we tried to capture. And I had a lot of help with the cast that Fran gave me. That's amazing. And you did capture it. Yeah. Benevolent masculinity. I love that term. We'll start it. We'll start it. We'll say enough yeah. with toxic masculinity. <laughs> we want benevolent. Um, I mean, I'm a liberal Democrat and I'm all for LGBTQ causes. And, you know, I'm writing a movie, a, a comedy about trans people and all of that. But I, I do think, you know, we have to really savor and protect you know, this wonderful thing called masculine and feminine just because people have abused it and misrepresented it, you know, doesn't mean we need to lose it. Um, and hopefully really just laying it down on film in, in our little comedies, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that will help a little. So I'll, I'll always feel a little bit proud of that. Yeah. There's space for all of it. I think Yeah, there's space for all of it. So. Yeah, and I'm not afraid to say that because I know people are so scared now to talk about anything to do with 
sexuality or anything. And also there, there could be this spark absolutely with LGBTQ Southern people. But I'm just saying there's, there's something about Southern men and women. Uh, I'm not speaking politically or about science or anything. I'm just saying, I just believe that when Southern men and women get together and they are the right combination of masculinity and femininity, there's just nothing better in the world of romance for me, you know, and I just believe in that, you know, it Jean is very Southern, even being not from the South, you know, she has such a softness and such a femininity about her, but boy, is she strong. You only have to look at her in hacks, you know, to see the inner core of strength that comes out of her. And, but when you talk to her, it, I mean, honestly, she's the softest, most feminist, most feminine woman I think I know. Uh, but yet she inhabits this, this great strength, you know, of just can endure anything and can give it back better than she gets. Um, yeah, I mean, she's pretty awesome. That is so amazing. And you reminded me, I, I wrote a play about uh, Jimmy Carter and, and Rosalind Carter is a character in it. Uh, and and that relationship, and one of the reasons I wrote it was I was so fascinated as both a kid and then as an adult with their relationship to each other. And, and yes. that's just a, that Southern couple Ness, where they're both partners yet individuals, and there's something really. And you still felt like, oh, I think they're going to make love tonight. You know, <laughs> <laughs> in fact, I have a friend who was a speechwriter for him, and he confirmed that. You know, he said Jimmy would be drinking wine and then talking a little bit, which shocked me. It, I mean, he wasn't really talking out of school, but he was talking about how he liked to have a glass of wine before lovemaking. And I thought, oh my goodness, I shouldn't even know this. But um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what was your play? I have to check on that too. What was the name of your play? Um, it's called Confidence and the Speech. And it's about the 10 days before President Carter's crisis of confidence speech. But it's told from a modern feminist oh, perspective, looking back wow. at that time. And in the play, yeah. Um, the, the president's actually played by a woman, um, who's telling the story of her time as a young female intern. And so the guy that's asking her questions about this time plays her as a young female intern in the Carter White House. So it's, it's kind of a made up, uh, uh, package for a real life event. And, um, yeah. but I use it to talk about the confidence it takes to speak up in the room, women in politics and, um, and, and, you know, yeah. all the, all the, leaps you have to make in your head to imagine a woman president. It may have been, you know, written right around the time of, I don't know, 2016. Um, but it's um, but, ahead of its day that hasn't been realized even yes. today. But yeah. yeah. Well, yes. that sounds very uh, layered and interesting. And I congratulate you on that. That sounds so original. Uh, the courage to speak in the room is something that, um, you know, and I won't talk about this now. We can talk about it later. But, you know, I, I did take a lot of the money I made from Designing Women and take it back to my hometown. And, you know, we are the number one donation spot for the NRA in my town. And um, I just wanted to do something for the girls. And so, you know, I started this foundation. Um, and that's really the big thing that we do is give people, the, the women, the courage to speak in the room. Um, we spent, we sent dozens and dozens of girls all through Europe and all, you know, every year they would go to the Broadway shows. They would come out here and stay with me and go to the sound stages. Um, and so we're going to have a big event next year. Everybody's coming home. We've put 177 women through college and we've sent people to Harvard and Duke and, and really just, you know, it was, it was really my money from designing women that, that did that. I'm not bragging, but I just mean, I, I want to make clear that it was, my money came from Dixie and Delta and and um, Annie and Jean. And so they really did that, you know, with me. But it, I'm just so proud of it because the women are all coming back. Only one has passed away. So the, they're all saying they're coming back next year. Um, and we're just going to have a big homecoming. But, yeah, I've been getting a lot of the letters from the, the young girls who traveled. Um, who wouldn't have gotten to do these things otherwise. 
And, you know, they all talk about what designing women, the spirit of it, and what this money that came to them because of those women, you know, has has meant to their lives. And it's meant everything. Um, and this all started really with me when I was a little girl. You know, my dad gave this river I talked about that I used to bring up to my agents. It is mm-hmm. the most beautiful river, I think, in the world. It's kind of wild. It's called Current River. And it does come from the largest natural springs in the world. And my dad loved it. He grew up on it. And he gave me my own canoe when I was seven, you know, and he gave me the paddle. And he said, you cannot paddle any boy on this river. Don't let anybody tell you otherwise, you know. And that river just became my world, you know, whether I was paddling around in saloons by myself or, you know, my I had a couple of girls who were like my sisters who had the cabin next door, you know, and oh my gosh, we smoked grapevines, which are, you know, nothing. You just smoke them to be smoking. But, you know, we'd sit around with our legs crossed and, you know, give speeches and <laughs> talk about everything. And we were big readers. Um, but anyway, that I always think about, you know, that gave me the confidence to speak up in the room was just the fact that you know, I owned that river and I did race all the boys on that river in my canoe. Um, And so just the the, uh, template of that, I just kind of wanted to, you know, bring back to my town and give all these girls a leg up, which, which I think they really got, you know, and I'm anxious to see them in person because I haven't seen them. And this started in 90, about So I'm really anxious to see them all and see what they're doing. That is amazing. Okay, we want to keep talking. We're going to take a a short break. Okay, we're back. Is this the Claudia Foundation? Yes, the Claudia Foundation is the umbrella of it because, um, you know, my mom came from, uh, didn't have a sister, her mother died when she was 13. This is in a little tiny town, Alicia, Arkansas. Um, and she grew up, you know, um, really didn't get to go to college because her dad didn't have the money. And she came to the last place they moved was Poplar Bluff, Missouri. <laughs> and they came over the Arkansas line. The, the, she'd grown up in Arkansas. But anyway, um, she was the secretary for my dad's, uh, he was a lawyer. And he came home from the war, and there she was working for my grandfather. My grandfather's the one who's really responsible for me becoming a writer. Um, he only went to sixth grade, and he wanted to be a lawyer, so he studied and clerked under a judge. And then he became a lawyer, and then he became a newspaper editor. And then he became what today would be called a civil rights activist. And he is really responsible for the liberal spirit that I hope exist in my shows. His name was C.T. Bloodworth. He was about six foot four with white shock of hair. My favorite picture of him, he's in a Venice canal in a gondola with his Stetson in the air waving it. Um, he, When he died, I got all of his books, Thackeray, Shakespeare, Dickens. He had four sons. They were all so interesting. They put themselves through law school by playing poker. And they defended him when he got in a huge fight with the Klan uh, my grandfather defended and, and was a, found abhorrent, you know, that they were tarring and feathering black people, running them out of town. This was in Corning, Arkansas. So they had a lot of shootouts at my grandmother and grandfather's house in Arkansas. The governor would come. I mean, it was a huge thing. It went on for years. Um, and finally, they did shoot my grandfather in the chest, and he lived, but he moved his family just across the state line to Poplar Bluff. That's why I grew up there. So then his sons grow up, and my dad became a Japanese war crimes prosecutor, and my uncle, my Uncle Charles, was a judge advocate at Nuremberg, and he brought home the um, the transcript from the Nuremberg trials that was written in hand, and we gave that to the University of Missouri. But all the sons became lawyers, and it was the largest family law firm in Missouri in the 50s. But the way they were different is that you know, they always came, they were they were interested in social justice and they had read a lot and all of the boys could recite, you know, Longfellow and Shakespeare. It just went on and on. And I grew up being around that. I never mastered that myself, but 
you know, it was just common, you know, they, they would get out their cocktails and if it was sunset, somebody might be reciting Tennyson. Now, I'm not saying they did that every day, but I mean, it was in our lives, you know, uh, and it was interesting and they were interesting and they were always very aware of what was going on in the town. And my dad was really alone in a lot of his opinions. Nevertheless, people loved him. He was a very popular person. But, you know, we couldn't join the country club because blacks and Jews couldn't belong, that kind of thing. Then when he died, I said that in his eulogy, and my mother said, well, he also didn't want to pay the dues at the country club. (laughs) (laughs) I looked like my dad. My mother looked like a movie star. And because she didn't have all of this female support, you know, uh, I was everything to her. I was her only daughter. I have a brother also. But um, anyway, when I, you know, was a, she died of AIDS in um, uh, 1986. And the day I found out that she had AIDS is the day I found out that Designing Women was going to be a series. And so it was very, very and, you know, hurtful and and awful. For six months, she died Thanksgiving of that year, and my husband's mother died four weeks later. So it was oh a pretty God. horrible year. And But, you know, they canceled Designing Women, and my husband came out here and saved it. He got viewers for quality television, you know, behind him. He got 50,000 letters to come in, and he got Bud Grant, the president of CBS, to raise the white flag. CBS literally raised it, which would never happen today, and said, okay, we're going to give you another chance, because they had been moving it around, and they hadn't given it a chance. Um, But anyway, my mother, yes, I wanted to honor her so much, uh, because she, you know, just gave me everything. My dad gave me my confidence, but my mother just poured all the love in the world into me, and, you know, that is part of being confident, I think, giving someone confident is to just love them up every day. Uh, I've never felt like, you know, I had to get a man or or be anything because I felt so loved, uh, you know, from her. And so, uh, uh, like, being married, being happy would just be icing on the cake because I was already good to go, you know, just from being around her. So I wanted to kind of give that love to the girls in my hometown I did a film for Hillary. I was very close to Hillary Clinton's mother, Dorothy Rodham, who Mm -hmm. stayed with me a lot at my house in Santa Barbara. And they had basically the same relationship. You know, her mother grew up um, with in a very impoverished environment and two teenage parents who were 16 years old who could not could not take care of her. She was given to a family, California relatives who were very unloving. And yet somehow she invented love, you know, and she figured it out and she just filled Hillary with love and that gave her all the confidence to be who she was. And in 2016, I made a convention film for Hillary that was online um, and it told their story about mm-hmm. Dorothy inventing love and giving it to Hillary and then Hillary going all over the world, you know, and helping girls in Afghanistan and, and women who, you know, who are living in poverty all over the world and the misogyny that keeps women down all over the world. All of that came from a mother and a daughter. And so I tried to kind of duplicate that, you know, with my own mother and hopefully on a smaller scale, you know, have done kind of the same thing. I love the idea that you don't have to take sort of abuse and terror and fear in your life and continue that. You can actually turn that and decide you're going yes. to make a decision to make sure that the people that come behind you and the people that are around you are going to be filled with love. Um, you can a interrupt it. Choice. Yeah. yeah. And that's what Dorothy Rodham did. I know the show's not about Dorothy, but I love her so much. I have an English garden at the foundation that's dedicated to mothers and to Dorothy and to my mother. Um, Dorothy at six years old was on a train. You might know the story because Hillary yeah, has mm-hmm. talked about it. She was on a train to California with her little sister who was three, alone on a train from Chicago for three days. You know, the stories that make me cry the most are the ones where women help each other. Mm -hmm. Because I do think things are so stacked against us all over the world. And, you know, I mean, I won't make my big soapbox speech here because that's not what it is kind of. I know it's what you all are about. It is what we (laughs) do. (laughs) 
<laughs> Go we got to get some comedy in. We got to get some comedy in here. But no, just that you know, our our national hobby is obviously killing and raping women, and then making shows about it and documentaries about what was in the killer's mind. And I'm just so fed up with all of it. You know, the, mm-hmm. I mean, the, just the, uh, it's really a celluloid holocaust. You know, mm-hmm. of what we do to women, and then the way women are treated all over the world, whether it's the Taliban or it's the pornography industry, you know, that is now commensurate with really the arms sales. Mm. It's the biggest, the biggest uh, business in the world. I just feel like women, and I feel like we're going backwards too, and I won't get into all of that, but it's very disappointing, you know, and women are just constantly over-sexualized now, and it's, you know, it's the side boob, it's the under boob. Have you seen this? You know, I'm not afraid of nudity, but why is this the only thing, you know, that's being constantly presented everywhere? I just feel like, you know, I don't want to be like old lady Bloodworth screaming, get off my lawn or in my day, <laughs> just the Kardashian thing, just constantly, you know, oh my God, here I am. Here's my, ass. look at my ass once more. I, I watch the show. I know them. I've been to their house to dinner. I try to kind of keep up with the Kardashians, (laughs) but enough is enough in the show. One of the shows I saw recently, they found a book in an old box in their garage, and they were so puzzled. No one knew what to do with it. It was a book. (laughs) I was screaming, (laughs) read it, read it. Anyway, enough. Okay, thank you for letting me get that in. Oh my God. You're absolutely right. I mean, even to something like, you know, Vanity Fair does this cover every year of, you know, up and coming people in Hollywood. You, in some years, it's all men, some years it's all women, sometimes a combination, but in the year that it's all women, all the women are dressed in lingerie or bathing suits or whatever. And then the men, they're all in t shirts and suits and. Yeah, uh, it's so maddening. Like, I, I don't understand it. And then when they do their Oscar shows, they've got Sofia Coppola halfway lying on a bed with her legs up, with her pants pulled down. I'm like, oh my god! Well, when did Marty Scorsese do this? When he was nominated, you know, it's yes. just so. I mean, I don't care who's not. Everybody can be naked, you know. I, I'm fine. Human body can be beautiful. We get it. But what is the purpose? What is the message? I don't understand it. And this latest HBO offering, Lily Rose Depp, you know, is completely naked for the entire series with her legs spread, with him looking like he's giving her some kind of gynecological exam and then, you know, abusing her in so many ways. And then they they rush in to say, oh, but we're showing you that that's wrong. You know, we're teaching a lot. <laughs> well, of course that's wrong. We, we don't. We don't really need to hear that your your concerned parents are concerned producers. We know what you're doing. And for that to fill in where succession was, come on. You know, that was shameful. Um, so anyway, yeah, I went over between uh, looking at The Idol on HBO and I switched over. And on another channel was Harrison Ford in Witness watching Kelly McGillis prepare to take a bath. And he was at the door and she didn't know it. He was just looking at her so lovingly. And I thought, oh, wow. You know, I'm sorry for all the young people looking at this other trash that they might not see these things. You know, Harrison is old and that's an old movie. But, you know, that kind of, um, you know, really uh, carefully, brilliantly constructed sex scene is just so erotic and appealing, I think, so much more than just, you know, what is it now? Every love scene is just slamming a a woman around the room, choking people, choking women. I don't get that. Like, I'm just, I ask my husband, does anybody just like make love anymore? Like, it doesn't even exist in filmmaking anymore. I know we're way afield of designing women. (laughs) This is a whole new podcast. You can tell you can <laughs> you can tell I've been cooped up during the pandemic. <laughs> but anyway, it, it kind of does stem from the kind of, you know, romance we were trying to show on behalf of the women who like designing women. I would like to appoint myself one of their representatives to say, you know, ladies, please stop taking us backwards, you know. 
We can do a whole podcast. What has happened to women? That's what we can call it. Oh, and you know, you're so right. That scene in uh, um, Witness between Kelly McGillis and Harrison Ford is like one of the hottest scenes in movies. Isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If only young people could be exposed to these things. And I think their world is smaller, you know, maybe than ours was, at least for girls. Because I don't, I'm older than you ladies, but, you know, when I was growing up, the world was our oyster, you know, and Mm -hmm. we were running free, you know, I mean, we did what we wanted. We said what we wanted to say, you know, we loved who we wanted to love. I mean, we were really wild in that sense. Mm -hmm. And, oh, I just see girls trying so hard to be, I'm going to say the word because that's what's used in our industry constantly. Mm-hmm. Is she is she hot? I see women as that is their greatest aspiration, and it makes me sad. You know, there's just so much more to life than this over-sexualization of everything. It's pornography. I mean, we didn't have yes, we didn't is, have really. pornography available, like five minute pornography available to us on the internet freely. Yeah. Now, by high school, they've all seen pornography, and we know that that's where women are getting beat up for the first time. They see it. They see it. That's what it is, and and they're being taught that's what sex is. And they replicate it. That's correct. Yeah, and you always begin to think that's what you do to girls. That's correct. I just think, you know, I, I think there's a lot of people, a lot of people in America who feel this way, and I think the conservatives in our country would be surprised to know that a lot of liberals like me feel the same way. Mm. Um, And this could be a meeting ground, you know, for all of us. If we can't agree on Donald Trump or January 6th, let's agree on this. You know, it's a starting place. You know, let's start teaching our kids, you know, let's start teaching our boys that this is, this is really not, you know, how things are supposed to be. And teaching our girls that they are worth way more than this ridiculous over objectification, you know, of their genitalia and of their bodies and of their, their sexual beings. Uh, I just feel like a lot of girls just aspire to this now. And I do everything I can, you know, in my little hand to get the girls not to feel that way. Okay, this is another yeah. podcast because we barely <laughs> talked about it. <laughs> and I have two stepchildren and, and then a 10 years younger boy. And yeah, you want to raise good people. And it's very challenging right now because there's so much cruelty in the air. Cruelty is a good word. Thank you for saying that. It is cruel. You know, what they're doing. I, I'm so glad you said that. A lot of this stuff, I think, I think girls have become very confused that they confuse cruelty with masculinity, you know? Yeah. They think if the guy treats them poorly, that's sexy until they can't take it anymore or they're dead, yeah, you know? It's... And, and when we were, and I don't know, I always thought, I think kindness is probably the sexiest thing around. Um, You know, that's what I think about my own husband when I see a man like Brad Pitt or George Clooney. Um, You know, a lot of the actors who I know are kind, like Mm. Keanu, I was was wanting, I guess because of my canoe. You want to make it Um, a canoe, yeah. (laughs) Anyway, you know, that's what I find sexy because they're so kind to people. Uh, That's a turn on. And now I think that's interpreted as weakness. Like during the pandemic, you're not as social and you watched a lot more TV, which is what happened to me. I saw a lot more of what what is out there. And it it made me feel lonely and sad and and depressed that, you know, how will you ever fix this? Well, okay. I mean, these these young people, they may never get over this. I mean, this is what they think and we and this is what they feel is hot and sexy. You know, and I don't think Hollywood does anything to help. No, I was no. chosen. I was chosen. <laughs> no, I mean they're they're the cause of it. They are the cause of it, absolutely. And I brought this up at the Academy of Television Arts and Science because I had one year on the board. Um, every year, the president gets to have a guest, and I was chosen by the president of that year to be the guest. And I, I don't really like organizational 
things too much. I mean, I don't enjoy it. I don't join a lot of clubs. But I went, you know, and I made my little speech there. And I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating censorship, but I'm just saying we can do better. You know, like the, does, um, does the actors really need to walk naked on Game on Game of Thrones mm-hmm. down the street naked? Why is she the only one? Why is she the woman doing it? You know, these are just examples of even the most prestigious cable uh, organizations do this crap. And I'm just saying, think about it. You know, I I know you see yourselves as you know, the most liberal, open-minded people in the world. And you, and you do this, you continue to do this. It's, it's denigrating women and you do it because you can. And I don't want to pass a law that stops you. I'm just asking you to consider maybe don't do it on, you know, at at every opportunity, maybe turn it down for your daughter or your wife or even your mother. Maybe don't do that. And, oh, it was not well received. Um, And the arguments went on even when I got back to my office. I still had, I won't say who, but the head of a major network called me. And we had quite a long argument because I, you know, made him feel defensive. He called me to tell me that he hoped his own daughter would be president. Um. And I said, <laughs> what you know, country? <laughs> <laughs> he was so defensive because they don't see themselves that way, you know. And you hit a they nerve. They just think it's yeah. art. It's art. Yeah. Yeah. You hit a nerve. Yeah. You called him I, on I really, it. I hit a nerve. Yeah. Yeah. Because it, and he's it, a very cool guy. Yeah. It, you know, he's a cool it, network. A cool guy. It may be art, but it's it's for me. It's about the balance. If there was a balance to exactly. all of this, then then fine. But yeah. there's no balance. It's very tilted. It's very tilted. And women are losing this battle. And, you know, if you think if you say something, you're not going to be cool. You're going to sound like Tipper Gore when she got <laughs> after the music industry for bad lyrics. But, you know, uh, I mean, um, come on. Listen, have you listened to some music? You know, the violence toward women the horrible descriptions of their genitalia, what they're going to do to women. And then all these big corporations are giving them millions of dollars. I don't know. It's just a whole, you know, all of the entertainment industry is riddled with this misogyny and nobody wants to talk about it because we're supposed to be the supportive, liberal minded feminist people. But, you know, we're kidding ourselves because we're going backwards so, and it is really kind of relevant to your podcast, although I know there's no way that this can be part of a, you know, the designing women. You'll be surprised. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> if you think we're going to make a career you know, out of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> but I just think, well, you could, you know, you could pick this up and kind of have this be a tributary of, you know, the mm. river you've been riding, um, back to the canoe metaphor. Because it is so important and it is connected. We have seen how television changes the world. We have seen how how television changes the world for women. You know, and my three mentors when I started out who were Norman Lear, Larry Galbart, and Jim Brooks, and I had no idea because I was so young, I was just out of college. I had no idea that that was an incredible thing that had happened to me. You know, now I get it. I mean, it's like winning the, you know, the billion dollar lottery. And there weren't that many women comedy writers. And my partner was Mary Kay Place. And we were kind of exotic because we were just cheerleaders from Oklahoma. We didn't come from an urban environment, you know, and we were trying to be funny and to and to be real serious comedy writers. So what I found out, though, is here's Norman Lear, you know, changing the world uh, racially, changing the way people feel about black people. And then here's Larry Gelbart changing the way people feel about war. And there's Jim Brooks changing the way people feel about women and the way women feel about themselves with Mary Tyler Moore and Rhoda, you know, which I grew up on. And so I just see how powerful it could be because I lived it. I saw it. I participated in it. You know, I got to work with all those men. And I honestly feel like Norman and Jim and Larry changed the world, the world more than most legislation can do. And so it breaks my heart now that we still have even more ways to reach people. You know, never could you have imagined 
from the four networks. We have 500 outlets now, and this is what we're putting on it, you know? And it just, it's just, it's a real squandering of, a, of an opportunity that wasn't available, you know, for hundreds of years. And now we have it. Now we can reach everybody and we can change the way men think about women and women think about themselves. And we're just not doing it. Instead, we're reverting back to, you know, this toxic masculinity all over the world. And women better be quiet and, you know, do what we say. Um, And that's what's happened. So I'm just hoping, you know, that... um, There'll just be more and more. Yes, there's some beautiful things on cable, but just more and more brilliant, edgy, original, new things for women that are not over-sexualized. And what is the chance for that? Right now, I feel like it's pretty slender. What do you all think? Two words. Okay. Barbie and Oppenheimer. (laughs) (laughs) I can't can't even describe my, my frustration and anger. That those are like, they came out on the same day. They're being touted as like the best. Bar- Barbenheimer. Barbenheimer. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Barbenheimer. I mean. Well, well, the critics are all little boys now. Is that it? But it, it's just so weird. Is that the femininity and then like destroying the planet. <laughs> I oh, just, you I know just, what I mean? <laughs> really? That's well, all you guys got? Good at, <laughs> you, you guys are so good at condensing my rambling because then after I've done you'll just go one word pornography (laughs) (laughs) that's that's exactly what I've been trying to say and then you just did it again yeah I think uh, but what are we going to do and we can see this happening to us to our daughters and to you know all the women we care about we can see it happening in front of us but we're not stopping it One reason is I think people publicly are real. Women are very afraid of being considered not cool and not sexy, you know, and I know actresses are very much afraid of being labeled, you know, oh, she's, you know, she's trouble and she's not hot. You know, Mm -hmm. nobody wants to be not hot. If you're not hot, you might as well be dead. (laughs) <laughs> and so, you know, unless you can be Maggie Smith or somebody like that, for all the women in between, like between 50 mm-hmm. and 75, mm-hmm. very dangerous area to still be hanging around. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of women on the on the precipice who are getting ready to go into that dark tunnel. <laughs> like, you know, and, yeah, you know, where they pick you up in the van and take you to Palm Springs and throw you out in a ditch. <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> That's kind of what's coming. And, you know, because we've done nothing to change the perception. There are still cultures that revere older women. Unfortunately, we're not one. And the interesting thing is, I just think there are millions of us, but we're not organized. You know, we're not organized. And I don't, you know, at some point we get old and tired and we go, good luck. (laughs) (laughs) I came already. It's your turn now. (laughs) Yeah. But um, all you can do is your little corner of the world and make it better. Exactly. And and make it more beautiful and make it more, make it smarter, make it more unafraid, like the unafraid girl, you know, make it brave. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I first sold designing, I first got my first big check from Designing Women, I called You know, my town is not a very pretty town, and the girls, I felt, had nowhere to be uh, to just be themselves and to read and to spend an afternoon and to have access to things that the public library doesn't have, you know, just like Mm -hmm. beautiful coffee table books and, um, you know, learn how to cook food other than what was really, you know, native to our area. So anyway, I called Crowther and Cyan, who are the 400-year-old English architects who did, you know, the Queen's architects, I should say. Mm. They redid Windsor Castle. They are, you know, responsible for all the palaces. Um, And um, I said, I'm here in the Ozarks, and I would love for you to build a big English library for all the girls in my town because I think they're the most beautiful rooms in the world. 
And could you do that? And they said, oh, ma'am, we don't even know where you are. What are the Ozarks? <laughs> and so they looked, <laughs> they looked it up and they called me back and they said they would do it. And they built it in England, came across the Atlantic, came down the Mississippi River by barge, came to my town on flatbed trucks. They lived in the town for almost a year and they reconstructed it on my grandparents' house next to it. And then we redid the entire thing, but the library stands on its own. I have Lord Byron's fireplace, (laughs) beautiful things. And um, so, and then now we're just now getting, you know, then I got involved in politics, so I didn't get to do everything I wanted to do. But now we're doing the English gardens and we're, I think we're going to be on tour America, I hope, um, and have people come see it. But meanwhile, this is where, you know, all the girls can come and they've, through the years where they've met and they've, you know, gone on their trips and come back. It's really like a big clubhouse, you know, for the girls. So I feel like as I, you know, I'm getting older, okay, that's going to exist forever. Nobody can take that away. And there's a philosophy that I think we've instilled in the girls that they'll pass it along to their daughters. So how many, how many girls does that make, you know, all together? Well, we've probably affected maybe 500 girls, but maybe that will multiply. And I guess that's the way we'll have to do it. Do you mm-hmm. all feel like you know a lot of girls who are who are of the same mind as you, and that makes you feel good about the world? I am astonished at the generation that's happening and, and coming up, the, the younger generations. Because as much as they're being fed consistent, you know, messages of cruelty and pornography and, and also just damage, Mm -hmm. they're the kindest people ever. My kids and their friends are so kind to each other, so supportive. Uh, And maybe they're a unique particular batch, but. But I think that the challenge that we're in, and that is very hard for me, and what I assume my generation to be, is we're in this transition. And so the access to so much kind of horror and pornography and sort of terribleness is also in the same pipeline as access to other cultures, other people, other understandings, and vast communication that can be misused, but can also be used to communicate with like-minded people to, to, to sort of spread the message that, you know, that gender is a different conversation for the younger generation. And in a way that's much more accepting of who you want to be and how you want to be and when you want to be it. And so I actually have a lot of hope for that generation, though I think they're being damaged. Like, I think that it's that weird conundrum of the internet and of this, this fast communication where it, we're being, you know, sort of pummeled with really kind of horrific things. And yet it's also accessible to find someone who loves what you love wherever they are. And if you're alone in your town and love whatever it is that you love and no one else loves it, you can find somebody online who loves it too. And you can recognize that community and be in community with that. And so, I think it's going to be a very tumultuous few generations. Yeah. But when I'm looking for hope, right? And, 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 you know, I'm yes. a big optimist. Uh, I think of, of ADC TV ladies and Melissa, <laughs> Melissa's rolling her eyes at me right now, I'm sure, but <laughs> not really. <laughs> no, I, I'm hearing you. I, I like what you're saying. I, I think it's so clear what you're saying, you know, is that it, there's a kind of a war going on mm-hmm. for the soul of our girls. Yes. And I I do understand both sides because you explained it yep. so perfectly that everything I've been complaining about and you all are saying, amen, we hear you, we feel the same way. I'm so glad you said that because I, this is the other conversation I've had with my friends is that we are gobsmacked by how compassionate and empathetic these young girls are, you know, mm-hmm. that they want mm-hmm. inclusiveness. They will not stand for anybody being bullied or ridiculed. You know, I think, oh, my God, these are like just what you said. These are the kindest, dearest people, and they feel so deeply. But yet there's this other thing happening to them, you know, an assault on them, really, Mm. where you feel like because of the not only the Internet and the pornography, but just the way 
you know, the entire, um, you know, media industry of the world, you know, is presenting them and over-sexualizing them in a way that uh, just summons them and beckons them to try to be that creature or you're not worthy, you know, Mm -hmm. and it's got to be so confusing. It's like they have kind hearts and deep convictions about what is fair and how everybody has a right to be at the party, you know, but yet they're being told, you know, well, if you want to be at the party, you know, get your clothes off and, you know, uh, saddle up because, you know, this is the ride you're going to get. It's very interesting that you pinpoint it that way. And I don't think anybody really has that I've heard you know, I haven't read anything like that, but I, I think you've hit upon something. Well, it's, it's, it's part of the reason, like, you know, the deeper reasons of this podcast are, are looking at, you know, these shows that we loved and, and, and having a good time with them. I, I promise we will get to that good time. Um, but, uh, but also because <laughs> this is more important, really this, is. Is more, this is important conversations because this is how, how do we get here? We should be, we should be in a better future for our kids. We shouldn't have just pushed back women's rights 50 years. We should have been pushing them forward 50 years, you know, like, like, and, and so, and it's all tied. It's tied to this sort of, um, what I would say is sort of an out of control capitalism. It's tied to sort of this, this pushback against great strides for LGBTQ and people of color and black people and women. And and now suddenly there's this giant, oh no, we're going to shut that down yes. or we lose, you know, generations. And, and that's, it's sort of a, it is a fight that has come to a certain precipice. And yet it's also tied to the strikes, the actor strike and the, and the writer strike. It's tied to worker strikes and go, workers going, wait a minute. And the greed. We, the corporate greed. And the corporate greed. It's corporate greed. It's also just this cultural greed and controlling the information. And I'm sure we're going to, we, we better get to a conversation where we're talking about people in power doing damage personally to people as if it's their right. And that, filters down in the messages that they have sold us over the years and the stories that they have prioritized and that making sure that, you know, yeah, we're, we're going to make it edgy by, by doing all of our exposition while women are naked, yeah you know, and that's going to be art. And and don't worry, maybe we'll, we'll show you a guy too. Like it's fine. Yeah. That's what they do. Thank you. They show one guy's behind. Yeah. Yeah. And then we're good to go for about three months where another one has to get up to bat, <laughs> so to speak. Um, yeah, that's, you know, you're, you should have a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank God you said that. You're, you're <laughs> <laughs> no, but really, you're so smart. That was everything you just said is, is so true. At the base of it, though, since you have been so good at condensing what I've just said, I would, if I was looking through a little telescope right now, for who is the real offender in all of this, it would be the white, out of control, pissed off, toxic, masculine guy who is now stomping around all over the world, you know, and they're the people, I'm not saying they control the purse strings, but they are the people who are providing also big pushback on women Jews, Blacks, LGBTQ, because they're losing their power, you know, and that's what was happening on January 6th. That's what's happening all around the world. And, you know, we, the people who work in television, could have a big influence on that. It can't just be with elites coming on CNN, you know, and saying, oh, woe is me. You know, we don't change minds that way. You know, we've got to do programming that's really smart and brilliant and appealing. And I have to hand it to Taylor Sheridan, you know, what he's been doing with 1883 is showing a real America and that fearless girl who rides that horse every week, you know, is just incredibly appealing and beautiful. You know, that's the way we change their minds. Nick Kristoff always says, you know, you can tell Americans that 
50,000 people are dying of starvation in Africa and they won't send a check, but you tell them one story and that check will be in the mail. And I, I think, you know, just talking about how women can, you know, start to elevate themselves again. And uh, people always go, oh, well, a little sitcom shouldn't trouble itself, you know, to, I mean, how pretentious to change the world. And once again, I give you Norman Lear, Jim Brooks and Larry Galbart. You know, or even in our own way, just on designing women. You know, we did the strange case of Clarence and Anita and um, CBS, Jeff Zagansky was wonderfully supportive of us, you know, said, hey, I mean, he's a big Republican. He said, hey, if it's funny, do it. I'll put it on, you know, and I did. And I think I know from my mail, you know, that that, yeah, it it's a lot of people off and it made a lot of people change their mind, you know. And, and believe in need of help. So, I don't know. I'm just saying we have more tools than we've ever had to change the world. And we're just, we're just not using them. You know, we're not using them properly. And, and with the uh, respect that they just, I mean, they talk about far reaching, you know, there's almost nobody we can't reach now. Mm. But we just keep putting the same kind of, you know, some of it's brilliant. But so much of it is setting women back, and we don't have to do that. Yeah. I would have to say, I, you know, because I was trained on, say, some really amazing 80s TV ladies, um, I'm going to put you in that category of changing things between designing women and for women to find their voice and make those connections. Um, I was trained on how to speak by 80s television and particularly the women of 80s television so i'm putting you in that category with norman lear and james brooks uh with the shows that you created so we should probably talk about them you want to take a little break uh just for take a, minute. a little break was a nice segue yeah <laughs> excellent segue So obviously our discussion with Linda Bloodworth Thomason continues and is so great we are making this a two-parter. I don't want you to miss a bit of it. Please tune in next episode to hear part two of our deep discussion with her where we really do get to more Designing Women stories and we solve all the deep problems of misogyny. Okay, well, maybe not really, Sharon, but we talk about them, and the first step to solving a problem is identifying it. Seriously, if you loved part one, you're really going to love the second half of our in-depth interview with Linda Bloodworth Thomason. Please join us. Hey, we want to hear from you. What's the 80s ladies-driven TV show that you remember or have heard of and would like for us to cover? Tell us your thoughts at 80stvladies.com. And please help us make the show by going to patreon.com slash 80s TV ladies. As always, we hope 80s TV ladies brings you joy and laughter and lots of fabulous old and new shows to watch, all of which will bring us closer toward being amazing ladies of the 21st century. See you next time.